Hello my soccer universe and welcome to the last video of the year. The one where I review the storylines that rocked more or less in the soccer world my 2021. Uh, and it's a time to like a little bit recap everything that happened because some of the things you might have forgotten, maybe not. Now the one thing that I have been doing this year, because I was always afraid I'm gonna miss out, whenever there was something bigish happening, I kept a little notepad where I wrote down a few things. And together with that, I actually came up with a few topics. I will give you the top 10 moments, that will be the main part of the video. But I will also now start with uh, five topics that kind of missed out a little bit. And those, those are in no particular order. I actually want to start at home here. Lask and the Austrian national team had very, very similar stories the whole year. They were actually, over the years, were terrible. Except when it came to the big European competition. Uh, let's start at the Austrian national team. World Cup qualifying, a single disaster. Then at the Euros, rising high, reaching the next round, playing for once uh, the way you would expect them to do. And then uh, in the end, uh, it did not end well and Austria were nowhere to be seen and they still have a shot of qualifying for the World Cup. And for Lusk, it's a very, very similar story that uh, the whole year in the league was, uh, it was not going well. There was a clear downward trend from the previous two years that were actually pretty good. Uh, previous, I would say previous four or five years. I mean, 2020 was so and so, uh, 21 was not a good year for Lusk, except when they played in Europe. There, they were absolutely brilliant, had uh, one of the, they had their best campaign in Europe so far. So uh, very, very interesting uh, storylines there. I also will not talk about the Nations League Final Four, which I think was overall very entertaining. Two really uh, great semifinals, uh, a very enthralling final, although it took a while to really get going. Uh, and yeah, that with uh, the World Championship Champions actually winning it in Italy uh, over a Spanish team that really got be, became kind of everybody's darling slash dark horse in a, in, a, in a way. We also won't, we'll talk a little bit about Champions League, but overall the Champions League knockout stage, and I'm thinking they're mostly the PSG's for a, a first of all PSG against Barcelona, then also PSG showing against Bayern, and in the end as the wheels came off against Man City, I think it was highly entertaining in many ways, but there were other storylines there in, in there as well with Juve against failing, again failing against Porto. Real Madrid making actually a kind of deepish run and ousting Liverpool along the way, so... The Champions League again, especially in the August stage, largely delivered. However, it was not the great uh, competition that I found it to be in previous years. I hope this will uh, get better. Uh, you also won't find it. This actually a little bit hurts, but Villarreal, I have them back there, um, won the Europa League. Uh, the first ever title, and it's the Europa League in a penalty shooter that was, uh, yeah, Probably the craziest I have. Per no, the second craziest. I think the Ghana uh, Ivory Coast one in, in the Afcon. I think in 2013 was cra was crazier. But uh, no, 2000. What 2015? 2015. That that was crazier. But an absolute amazing penalty shoot, 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 shoot. Yeah. No goalkeeper could could save any uh, penalty un until it came that goalkeeper went against goalkeeper. So that was really, really uh, entertaining. And the last one, it's more of a re reason, but Ajax's European campaign so far uh, and how convincing they were is also something that really got me going. So those were moments that missed out and that you will not find, uh, you know, me talking deeper about them in this video. Before we go into the top 10 topics i also want to take a moment uh to review my the 2021 for the channel which personally i think for the growth of the channel was a really really good year um i think i started at around 300 now i'm at above uh 800 so uh very satisfied with that um i think i got a lot of engagement uh from you guys which is something i told i i, I totally enjoy Ooh. However, what really, really uh, took it to another level for me this year is not only that I got a personal engagement with you, I actually 
got for the first time really contacted by other collectors. I got a teeny bit into the collectors community, exchanging messages, uh, talking to a lot of people, getting involved in these mystery exchanges that I did it too, which were in many ways the um, highlight of my uh, year because uh, this was something that I never could, could imagine. And then to top it off, I got gifted jerseys, which to me, this is still something uh, that takes it to a whole other level. So for me, in that sense, it was a really, really good year. Also for the collection, you saw it already, a very, very good year. I grew a lot uh, this year. Uh, we'll talk about my goals for the next year in the first video of the new year. So uh, I want to say this also as a big thank you for being a subscriber, for being regularly watching, for uh, commenting for engaging with the channel, for reaching out. I mean, uh, the global reach in a way is the most amazing thing that I can talk about uh, from, you know, from the Philippines to America, over to uh, Great Britain and so on, uh, all over Europe, France. Uh, I love it. I love it. That's why I chose to do these videos in English and not in German, because I wanted to have uh, that global outreach, because I know but the game touches everywhere. Thank you very much for making my 2021 20, actually pretty awesome, I gotta say. Okay, let's get into the top 10 moments, 10 stories. Uh, again, I tried, I tried to kind of rank them, what was the most amazing for me, blah, 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 blah. But you know, take always this ranking with a bit of salt. Um, I want to start at probably the least enjoyable story of the year, although it had us all up in arms for about three to four days, and that is the rise and fall of the Super League. April 18th is a day that we probably will never forget because the Super League got announced with some of our favorite teams in there, six from England, three from Italy, two from, uh, three from Spain, uh, <laughs> with notable absences from Germany and France, uh, trying to announce, yeah, okay, Champions League, we don't need that any anymore, we do it all on our own, uh, and of course we will always be permanent members, blah, 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 blah. Um, it actually, I couldn't even believe it when it was announced. I mean, my first uh, thought was, okay, fortunately Milan is in there. <laughs> because at least I will have someone. But you know, when you think, no, this is not what I want to have. This was definitely not. And then it took me a while until I actually digested the whole thing and could get uh, made a video about it. And then the whole thing snowballed in no time. That within three days, the whole thing fell apart and big thanks to Premier League fans. Chelsea, most notably, but also then Manchester City, uh, Liverpool, uh, you know, all the other teams suddenly, uh, the f due to the fan pressure, they had to withdraw and quickly thereafter Atletico Madrid, AC Milan and then finally also Inter uh, caved in. So the only ones that are left are kind of the teams that went with their finances a little bit AWOL over the past years. And that is Juve, that is Barcelona, and that is Real Madrid, who still are Super League members. However, at the moment, this seems to be done and dusted. But I don't think we have seen the last of that. We got a Champions League reform uh, because of the Super League threat that I am totally against, to be honest. But okay. Moving on. Uh, the next topic that I have on my list is superstars on the move. We had, so for the video, April now we had... August, uh, August, the transfer window. You know, I don't really talk too much about transfers, but it uh, because you know all the rumors, blah blah blah. There are some good transfers, some bad tra tra transfers. I always think the reason why I don't talk too much about transfers on this channel is because yes, you can buy a great player and you can look positive ahead, but you always gotta wait a year or so whether the transfer was worth it. However, when the two biggest names of the game move within a month, that moves the needle. And especially the Messi one, that was the end of an era. This was the end of great Barcelona as we know it. And it will take probably a while until we get Barcelona back. I'm not saying that that and dusted, 
but I think they will go now to through a harder spell. Uh, gone are the days where they could toy with the league, play around and even uh, threaten for a Champions League, although the latter was already uh, done. The Cristiano Ronaldo move seemed to me more like uh, yeah, getting out of a bad situation uh, and landing in another bad one. Um, but let's talk Messi first because that was the first one where, you know, Messi, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, he came back from the Copa America, he had an extended vacation, he came back to Barcelona, uh, he was out of contract or already with all the intentions, every, everything agreed that he will sign. And then Laporta is saying, no, we can't sign Messi. Three days later, it was August 5th, three days later, Messi has a very tearful press conference and I was on vacation back then where he says yeah i'm so sorry i need to leave blah 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 and then uh under quick who where will messi go well there were only two destinations i have them to my left and to my right and it was psg that's why psg is up there where he joined probably uh he was kind of the crowning achievement of one of the best transfer windows of all time one well, that hasn't paid off at all and i remember that it was one of the few times i was absolutely right in, in, in my videos um it's going to be exciting, we're going to talk a lot about it, but it's overall going to be a total train wreck. <coughs> so far, PSG is a total train wreck. As for Cristiano Ronaldo, um, we knew that Juve wanted to kind of move on his salary, uh, open a little bit there. Cristiano was also not happy because Juve, I mean, he joined to be the crowning achievement to push him to a champ, Champions League title. Then they got rid of Allegri, they said, okay, we need to play a new style with Sarri. Didn't, uh, Sarri became very pragmatic uh, qu uh, quickly and then his third year he got Andrea Pirlo uh, who probably has done in hindsight a better job than we all ex uh, saw but the team was really really badly built with no midfield of note whatsoever and Cristiano has, keep, has been ge uh, keeping them afloat I think he saw the signs on the wall uh, they have been a disappointment in Europe he went out as simple as that and in the end, uh, he was, uh, I think he played one game for Juventus, where he almost scored the winner, was taken off by offside, next day he was gone. But he was not going to Manchester City, who was one of the, the teams who had a really good transfer win, 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 win as well, and they just wanted to have a striker, and he probably would have fit well there. No, in a foggy night maneuver, Manchester United snatched him. And yeah. I, and I was probably wrong, wrong, I thought that United will challenge for a title. They still can. Um, he lifted United for a little bit. Uh, he scored very many, many uh, important goals, especially in the Champions League, where he saved them. However, United is as much of a train wreck as Juventus are at the moment. So uh, a move that did not pay off. Let's see how it goes on under Rangnick. Next one up on the list uh, of things is, yeah, I have here a lot of Spanish teams. The La Liga title crawl, I've got to say. Uh, when we started the year, Atletico Madrid were way ahead in the league. And then there was a short period in February where they lost, they uh, drew, and suddenly Barcelona picked up steam. And I, I, I remember in March and early April, it seemed almost inevitable. Atleti were kind of not there. Real Madrid um, were doing quite well under Zidane. They, they got something going. And Barcelona kicked a little bit into over overdrive. The one thing that Barcelona could not do, they just couldn't. Whenever they could take the lead in the table, they could not win. And uh, especially a game at Levante, where I think they had a comfy 2-0 halftime lead, where they would have been first. They threw that one away, tactics changed, I think it ended in a 3-3, and that was the moment where Barcelona's title challenge, boom, fell apart. It took a little bit longer. However, what happened then is that with all of, of the teams kind of uh, competing or, you know, passing the baton, I don't want to be champion, you don't want to be champion, I don't want to be champion, no, 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 you take it. Sevilla at one point seemed really hell-bent on winning a title. They lose at home to Barcelona. Barcelona, as I said, Levante, but they also lose uh, Reigns El Clasico. Real Madrid in the worst uh, moments, although they had actually Atleti mostly under control and they had to heads, never really could challenge. And on the last match day, they actually were about to get first because Atleti found themselves down at Valladolid. But on the last match day, it was either Atleti or Real Madrid. And Atletico Madrid pulled through in a title race. That was exciting. 
But that was so unpredictable and so, as, as, as I said, nobody seemed to want to have this title that in the end it fell into Atletico Madrid's lap. A title that was long, long overdue, it must be said. However, um, <laughs> let's put it that way. Atletico Madrid fans will remember that fondly. La Liga fans will not necessarily remember this one as one of the marquee La Liga seasons. Okay, uh, going further with head-to-head uh, -head fights, I want to talk about the tale of Chelsea and Manchester City. How, how the tides turned. Um, Manchester City for almost the entire year played in their own league. Um, and I remember when I started this channel, I, I know, I, I remember uh, seeing the odds for who will win the Champions League and suddenly Manchester City were favorites, which I couldn't fathom at the time because uh, who Manchester, uh, Manchester, yes, they have Guardiola, but low, low look as God. Well, the tides have definitely changed. At this moment, Manchester City uh, are by far the best team in the world. And they showed this in the, pre in, in the Premier League. It was already late 2020 into 2021. They had an incredible streak where they just distanced themselves from the rest. We are seeing this again now uh, at this very moment in the, in, 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 in the season as well, where they just don't show any weakness. However, this dominance in the Premier League was also a little bit their undoing because also in the Champions League, they were cruising from all the time, especially the way they took uh, PSG to the sword. Yes. The first half in Paris, PSG was the better team, but then for three halves they completely outplayed a pretty good PSG team at the time. It has, to, it has, as we said, and they got into the uh, Champions League final, their first ever Champions League final. They got over the hurdle, a little bit over Dortmund, yeah, deserved, but you know, it was also unlucky. However, um, they got over the hurdle, quarterfinal, they got over the hurdle, semifinal, they made it into the first ever final and were the overwhelming favorite, favorite, favorite. I remember a headline saying Guardiola has uh, uh, found out football. He completely figured it out, bar none. Going to their opponent, Chelsea, who at the beginning of the year made one of the coaching hires of the year in Thomas Tuchel. They had just sacked Frank Lampard. They got Thomas Tuchel in, who had just been sacked by PSG. I had so hope for a Chelsea against PSG final, to be honest, um, because of that aspect, because I thought that, that 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 firing was not fair. And it took a little while, but very soon Thomas Tuchel actually uh, took a hold and got Chelsea on a true roll. It was not enough, although they were finishing third, but you know, uh, at the end of the season, kind of beat up, but they finished in the Champions League spaces rather, say, uh, safely playing some of, uh, uh, playing really convincingly for most of the time. Um, and most notably beating um, Manchester City, I think, in the FA Cup semi-final. Although it was always, whenever they played Manchester City, it was that one or the other team did not play full strength. They even beat them in the league away from home. Uh, also that they were also City already had kind of clinched the title. It was in the last uh, um, uh, months. It was kind of the last game for Aguero as far as far, 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 I remember in Chelsea somehow won that game. But in the build-up, I think uh, Tuchel had beat Guardiola already twice. However, it was always against uh, non-full-strength squads. And then the last time that they kind of had full-strength squads, City completely rolled over Chelsea late in 2020. So that was the build-up for the Champions League, where a uh, little bit luck of the draw, Chelsea were kind of flushed through. I mean, if you can uh, beat Porto, I think they got over Atletico Madrid rather easy, easily than Porto. It was also not too, 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 too much work, didn't have to exert themselves. Suddenly they got defensively very solid, that got them past Real Madrid, and they found themselves in the Champions League final. And the roles were pretty clear. However, Chelsea not only was a much, was better uh, adjusted to Manchester City in that one. Guardiola came up with a formation out of nowhere where he just, well, I think he wanted to just have, I think it was Raheem Sterling to play in, in there and suddenly it all didn't make sense any, 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 anymore. And Chelsea won comfortably, only by a goal, but it was never, never uncomfortable. Chelsea European champions and the best team in the world are again reeling. Now uh, we have to see the new season. The Chelsea really looked good at the beginning of the season. At the moment, they're falling, falling, falling. Where City again 
Uh, had a rough, kind of a roughish start, but now picking up the pace again and seem to be again undeniable. But maybe they should keep it a little bit challenging until the end of the season. Maybe that will be the way that they win the Champions League. The next topic that we'll have is also one for undeniable. Lille, champion de France. Yes! We talk a lot about PSG. We have not talked talk about Lille because PSG did not win the title. In an absolutely crazy title race where PSG always at the most inopportune moments managed to lose. They just couldn't get it together. They had this great uh, previous season where they made it to a Champions League final, won everything under, under the sun. And then it got off to a rocky start and they upset the up apple cart too much. And then in the end, it was Lil relentlessly and excitingly staying toe to toe with PSG. And the, it was him. They could have clinched, I think, the title at home. And they only got a draw at that point. Uh, which meant that the last match that they had to win away from home at RG, and you really had the feeling that if they draw drop again, PSG might just win, but Lille came through. To me, the Ligue 1 title race was as exciting because of PSG's weak weaknesses. There was At one, at one point, there was a four-way title race between Lille, PSG, Lyon, and Monaco, but one by one, they all dropped out. I think Lyon first, then uh, came Monaco, and at the end, it was PSG. And Lille left. It was a really, really, really exciting league uh, season overall. And it was crowned with uh, Lille winning a title that, yeah, they, <laughs> the bad thing, it was largely from the empty stays, is, is, is stadiums, but a title that no one really expected. You always thought that without spectators, um, the strongest team will win. Yeah, Lille was the strongest team. And amazingly, they didn't lose too many. Yes, Mike Mignon went to Milan and, and so on, but the core is still together. But again, they had a rough start to the to, to season. But I think uh, this little team was was at least pretty, 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 pretty excited and still can do some good things. Speaking of Mignon and Milan, Milan is the next one. Yes, Serie A was won by an Inter team that became totally undeniable. But what for me was the story, I am a Milan fan seeing here Milan finished second into the Champions League and at a point where it all you know they have been there for most of the season and then at one point they suddenly fell out of it because they hit a rough patch and then they picked it up again it was really I think a, a, around March where I really thought yeah Milan ha had blown their chances then they picked it up. They had a great week in Turin where they beat Juve away from home 3-0. This was kind of, in, in many, many ways, the deciding moment of the, that season that made it a success. Then they beat Torino 7-0 and then you just had to beat Cagliari and you had secured your Champions League spot. A draw. Which meant you needed to win at Atalanta. And that was something that I couldn't see because Atalanta at that moment were in second place. And that was a place that never had finished as high before. However, the way that this last match went, where Milan comfortably, yes, two penalty goals, but comfortably won at Atalanta. Pretty amazing. And I have to say, Milan is taking now a next step. Yes, the return to the Champions League, unlucky and not mature enough. Uh, Serie A started really well, but not quite there yet to challenge for a title, I think. Not quite there yet. However, the growth of Milan over the past two to three years, very, very positive overall uh, to the point where I say, okay, if it doesn't happen this season, next season, you got a challenge for the Scudetto. And I think just playing two or three times more in the Champions League will also do them a whole lot good. Getting into, uh, being drawn out of pot four was not a good thing. So yeah, but I have to say overall Milan made me this year very happy and I have to say this last match they where they beat Atalanta I think it was the same day that also Lille finished uh, the, the league season in France finished so this was kind of a head-to-head -head. Uh, that was an exciting day but not the best day of the season the rest is all international football which we didn't have too much about but I wanna start it a um, teeny bit on a downer uh, I was June 12th when Ericsson collapsed on the field. That was something, uh, the Euro tournament, it started brightly and then this happened. And the whole, I mean, 
for me, um, it was not only the shock that almost the player died there on the field. I remember coming down to, to my wife, they're having fun in the kitchen, and I'm looking at and I said, I think a player just died there. That it wasn't was actually a big relief. I found that the leadership in the Danish squad was absolutely outstanding, uh, especially from Simon Kerr, and I'm so proud to have him as a Milan player. Um, making the right things. Then also I have to say, while many TV stations, I have to say the Austrian TV did actually the, for once the really right thing to just stop. They figured it out. Oh, this is not, they just let, 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 let it be. And then the relief that Ericsson actually survived was a huge, huge, huge relief. And one that galvanized Denmark into becoming one of the best teams in Europe. Which gets us now straight into Euro 2021, which were probably, was probably the most fun month uh, this year watching soccer. As much as I enjoy my club soccer, I have to say Euro 21 was probably the second best Euros that I've ever seen. This was thoroughly enjoyable from the start to finish. Italy started out right with a 3-0 dismantling of Dark Horses Turkey, which went nowhere, and then Except for that one Ericsson hiccup, it all went bang, 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 bang. There were hardly any bad days and it all culminated in a crazy round of 16. They were first Spain beat Croatia 5-3 after um, um, extra time. And then Switzerland came back from a 3-1 deficit against France to beat France in penalties. Uh, a day that will live on as probably the most exciting day uh, ever in Euro history with so many goals scored and so many ups and downs uh, that Becker believe in, in both cases it was that the outsider took, took the lead, the favorite came back at a 3-1 lead and then it added 3-3. Uh, in one case, Spain got through over creation, the other case, Switzerland actually really pulled the upset over the overwhelming favorites. Um, so that was a day that I just had to be outlined because that was just nuts right, r r right there. But there were other uh, positive things there. You, uh, as I said, Austria did not uh, really disgrace themselves, although in a way I actually had hope, hope for that, that the coach gets fired soon. But it was, uh, you know, I will never be unhappy. And then against uh, Italy in the round, round screen, you really gave them a hard, hard time. Um, and probably could have almost beaten them uh, if it wasn't for offside in a way. So uh, that was a very positive. Of course, we need to talk about the two, uh, two other big teams in there. We had, I talked, I touched already a little bit of Spain. Um, England were always big favorites because you could play the entire tournament at home at Wembley, except for one game where you went to Italy. Um, and you overcame the big bad boys in Germany. Uh, big down, of course, the fans and all the rowdiness. And, you know, unfortunately, we got uh, the whistling of anthems back. Um, another positive, of course, was for me Denmark, uh, who were the darlings of the tournament. Absolutely. Uh, and every game played in Copenhagen was special. And I made a long video, video, video about it, but I have to say this was a thoroughly enjoyable tournament. And it ended with a final uh, for the ages. Quickly on the semifinals, I think the first one was a classic between a tug of war between Italy and Spain. Where actually Spain, I thought, was large, large, the better team, but Italy had the better end on the penalties. Uh, and England just had to outlast the Denmark team that was gassed from all the traveling and, you know, uh, they had reached a ceiling where England were very comfy and they had the better squad were in there. But, you know, I have never seen England in the final. So that was something special and I would be so happy for most of my English friends if there were not so many idiots out there that kind of mess messes up. And I don't want to mention the crazy Hungarians and blah, 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 blah. We go back to the Euros. But I have to end it. Uh, the second last is... The crowning of Messi. Argentina won the Copa America on well, it was 10th of July in um, uh, Rio. However, it was early morning already in Europe. So this was July 11th, the same day that the Euro final was. Um, 
I ignored the Copa America for most of the time because the format was idiotic. I got into it once it got into the knockout stage where I couldn't really see much life. I saw only highlights. But it was a decent tournament. But uh, it was unlike the Euros, which was kind of this uh, fun tournament. Yes, there were a little bit of uh, bum notes in there, but it was kind of this fun tour tournament all over Europe. Uh, South America is a completely different beast where uh, those teams really don't like each other. And it is rough going uh, in many ways to play in South America. So uh, that has to be said. But Messi played outstanding. Argentina found a system. Uh, and Messi was kind of the, you know, the cherry on top. But overall the team worked very, 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 very well. And they play in a final in Rio against Brazil. And they win it. Uh, thanks to a uh, great Angel Di Maria strike. It was not a great final. However, we finally saw Messi lifting a trophy with Argentina. Long, long, long overdue. And if you know, Argentina is among my three national teams that I love the most. And I was so happy to finally see Argentina win a trophy. And it has been since 93. And seeing uh, the greatest play of a generation win a title with the national team really felt satisfying it the whole day i was already yeah argentina and messi finally won is it as great of an achievement as uh portugal winning the euros talking about cristiano probably not but winning the copa america was long long overdue argentina had been waiting for it and had been knocking on the door and the day got only better Italy won the Euros. This was national team wise and probably the entire year my favorite day of the year. Two of my favorite national teams win major trophies on the same day. Italy, only the second time that I see Italy lift a trophy uh, with me be, being, be, 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 being a fan. Win in a final where they found themselves down after two minutes to England. In Wembley. So it was the same story. Argentina had to win in Brazil, empty stadium. Italy, full stadium, had to win at Wembley. Now, uh, of course, um, the difference between Brazil and Ar Argentina, Brazil will always be favored over Argentina, especially in Brazil. England, not so much. I mean, ahead of, of the game, I thought, oh, this will be a tough test for Italy because this England team is rested. They all played at home. They have all the support of, of the crowd. Uh, however, when you look at it on a blank sheet, what did Italy achieve internationally? What did England achieve internationally? Uh, it's a huge gulf there. So that made me a little bit pop 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 positive, but I never, I really played down my expectations. Totally played my expectations down for for this final. And I think for third third, third, third minutes, I really thought that England had Italy in the bag. However, they went defensively, messed it up. Italy got back into, into the game by the third, 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 third minute. It seemed inevitable that Italy would score an equalizer. Yes, they were lucky. I think, uh, was it Jorginho who should have been sent off uh, in stop in uh, extra time? But on the other side, you know, Bonucci's goal was not a beauty, but it exemplified that Chiellini and Bonucci, the old guard, one last hooray, you want to say, they lifted Italy up. And then it goes to a penalty shoot, I thought, yeah. England is going to win that, that, that one because, except for Argentina in 1990, I do not remember any team winning two penalty shoot, 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 in, in, in a row. And, well, history should have told me otherwise because England rarely ever win penalty, penalty shooters. But uh, I want to reiterate now again, before I go in my feelings, uh, how great it felt for Italy to, uh, to win this one, how happy I was. Um, Southgate in the penalty shooter did everything right. Yes, maybe he could have brought on the last two, Rashford and Saka, a little bit er earlier to get them a little, a little bit warm. But the way he put his shooters was the absolute right, 100% right decision. You don't want to have the superstar taking the last one at home because this guy has a whole lot more pressure than a young guy like Saka. Yes, he's young, he's inexperienced, but then there's not that much expectation on him. Whereas if Harry Kane is the last one to take that penalty, he will feel that weight extra. 
Now, going back to, 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 to the parachute, it was actually up and down. It went largely in, in Italy's favor. I really, li I, I really liked it. Uh, Donnarumma had saved one. Uh, uh, for, uh, a rash for pull, 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 pull. I think Belotti missed, uh, missed one. Uh, it was Italy uh, going first and England second. Belotti had, had missed one, but then Donnarumma uh, saved one. Then Rashford, I think, put the one wide. And so it was all down to Jorginho to convert. And Jorginho seems to be a lock. He got his saved. And then at that moment, I was already so high. The low. But then, no. Saka needs to convert. And I knew. At this moment, I, my the thought was, he's playing at home. He needs to convert this penalty to keep England in. And the pressure at home, and we see it repeatedly, the pressure for France at home um, in 2016. Uh, remember the penalty shooter 2000, Italy against the Netherlands. If you have a penalty shooter at home and you have a must win, this is the most pressure situation. And having said everything, it was a little bit too much. Saka did not take his uh, penalty well and Donnarumma saved it. And I cannot tell you, I have not felt such joy from a soccer game in a long time. Seeing Italy win this trophy, a trophy that they have been uh, threatening to win for quite a while during my time. I think it was long overdue that Italy wins the Euros. Felt really good. It would have felt for me probably better at a time where I was not as much in favor of England because I really like South 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 Southgate and there's something to like about the England team. But given all the bad stories around this final with the disorganization and the um, way that the English crowd reacted, it still felt good. But I actually thought it would have been nice to see England win as well, but not against my Italy. That was my moment of the year. And that on top of Messi winning it, still feeling the tears come, tears of joy. So yeah, it was a long video as the last one, but these were my 10 moments of the year. I absolutely, as I said, it was overall a good year. Maybe, speaking of Italy, World Cup qualifying at the end, it didn't end well, all that, but you know, this I will always remember. Italy winning the Euros, you cannot take this away. And this time, there was no bum note for me, because when they won the World Cup, it was the Zidane accident, uh, incident, not accident, incident. It was very deliberate. It was the Zidane incident that really uh, was a kind of, you know, didn't make me feel as joyous. But seeing Italy win this time felt good, felt right. They were the deserved winner of Euro 2020, even though Spain was better in the semifinals. In any case, Last video, long one for you uh, to end this year. Um, I would like to know what moments will you remember? Is there anything that, I mean, this is on my part, but is there anything that you would like to add? What was a great moment for the year? Uh, give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more. And I will talk to you soon in the new year. Bye. I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you might enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel as it will keep you updated on all the things that are rotating in my soccer universe. And with that, I'm going to wish you a wonderful day.